Hello, my name is Dan Merrick, and I'm Ruby's Director of Plant-Based Culinary and Development. I'll be your Ruby instructor for today's Plant-Based Feast of St. Patrick live event. I have a background in plant-based cooking and have worked in that field for the past 15 years for companies like Whole Foods Market, nonprofits like Whole Kids Foundations, many culinary schools, and currently sit on the board for Slow Food in the Institute of Child Nutrition. Today, We'll be taking a look at Ireland in anticipation of the Feast of St. Patrick on March 17th. I grew up in the Chicagoland area and St. Patrick's Day was a big celebration for us, but there weren't always a lot of options for plant-based eaters. Today, I'll show you a few recipes that I like to share on the holiday along with some fun drinks at the end. I'll feature a few of these recipes and you can find them in the attachment under the video. There'll also be a recording of this if you wanna go back and view the recipes again. A little bit of housekeeping before we start. On the right hand top of your page, you'll see a dialog box that says add question here. If you're inspired to ask a question or make a comment, type it in and it will make its way to the queue that you see on the right side of the page. You can also upvote questions by hitting the heart shaped icon in the individual questions and we'll answer those with more votes a little bit sooner. So let's get started with our Feast of St. Patrick. So often, Irish food has been associated with the humble potato and the famine. But the potato didn't actually come to Ireland until 400 years ago. Irish food has a long tradition dating back over 8,000 years. Many of the valleys are actually named for some of the traditional foods like the Glen Agary, which is the Valley of the Sheep, or the Colonel, which is the Meadow of the Honey. Sorry. I might have mispronounced those a little bit, but I'll do my best Irish uh, glens for you. And much of today's Irish cuisine actually has a focus on lamb and beef and pork, sausages, oats, gruels, and eggs. Not the most plant-forward menus, but many are switching the focus back to its roots, looking at local forest berries, nuts, mushrooms, and fruits. Today's class will be a very American-style feast, featuring potatoes as a main staple. So remember to keep your servings a little bit smaller, don't count calories for this holiday, and have fun with it. Today, we'll be looking at a traditional Irish lamb stew, which could also be called a beef and Guinness stew, but we'll do it with seitan. We'll also do a shepherd's pie, a vegan Irish soda bread, a traditional coal cannon, and a few alcoholic and non-alcoholic drinks to have for holiday fun. We're going to start out with a traditional Irish stew. This stew actually is based off of one that typically has lamb in it, but I replaced it with seitan. We're going to start with a quarter cup of flour, and we're going to put in some herbs. I'm only using about half of my herbs here because I'm going to use the rest later. It's about a teaspoon of each one. I'm going to get some rosemary, some thyme, and parsley. So I'm just going to combine my herbs here and then stir the flour. And I'm going to take my seitan and I'm going to dredge it in the flour. So I'm just going to mix it up to make sure it's coated. Now I'm going to take about a tablespoon of oil and coat the bottom of my heavy bottomed pot. Now after I get that heated up just a little bit, I'm actually going to start putting in my seitan one piece at a time and make sure that they're separated out. It's not crowding the pan. Once one side starts to brown, flip it over to flip the other side and put it on a paper towel on a cooling rack. You might have to do this in sections like I did here. Afterward, take a remaining tablespoon of oil, put it over the bottom of the pan, and start adding your vegetables. We'll start out with one large onion diced. I'm just going to put this in until it starts to get a little bit translucent. Then I'm going to start adding my other vegetables, starting with about six cloves of garlic minced. Now, I have kids, so I have baby carrots around a lot, so actually I'm gonna use 15 baby carrots here and just do a large dice on them. About three stalks of celery. About six potatoes and a large chunk or dice. I'm also gonna add the remaining flour and herb mixture that I used on my seitan. 
Now I'll add eight ounces of Guinness or a similar kind of stout or non-alcoholic version of that. I'm gonna cook it down until it's almost gone. So now I'll add the remaining herbs that I put aside that I didn't mix into my flour. And then I'm gonna add in my St. Anne chunks. Stir that around. Add about three to five cups of vegetable stock, depending on the thickness you want it. I did about three and a half cups for this one. So you're gonna bring it to a boil, then down to a simmer, and let it cook for about 30 to 40 minutes. Now I'll add two tablespoons of tamari. Stir that into the mixture as well. And we're done. This Irish soda bread is a vegan version that you can find on the Ribby website. We'll start by putting two teaspoons of lemon juice into two cups of almond milk. We want to let that sit for about 10 minutes after mixing that in. Then we'll take our flaxseed and water mixture, about two tablespoons of ground flax and about four tablespoons of water, and mix that together as our vegan egg. Lightly spray your 9x5 pan with a little bit of oil and then cut out parchment paper for the bottom of it. You can see that 10 minutes later, our almond milk is curdled a bit because of the lemon juice making a buttermilk. Now we'll start to mix our dry ingredients, starting with 2.5 cups of whole wheat flour. We'll get that into our bowl and then add about a half a cup of all-purpose flour. Next we're going to add about 2 tablespoons of brown sugar. Now you want to make sure you crumble this into the mixture so you don't have any big chunks of brown sugar as well. Next I'll add one teaspoon of baking soda, sifted, and one teaspoon of baking powder, sifted. Then about a teaspoon of salt. We're going to mix that together with our steel cut oats and then create a small well in the center. Now we'll mix our wet ingredients by putting the flax mixture into the almond mixture. Then we'll pour it into our flour and then mix it in. I actually like to start mixing it by hand. You don't want to over knead this because it actually developed too much gluten. So I'm just going to slightly pour it into my 9 by 5 pan and pat it on the top. Now we're going to bake this at 325 degrees for about 40 minutes. When it comes out, you want to put it on a cooling rack and test it with a toothpick. There should be no batter stuck to the toothpick when you pull it out. After it cools for about 5 minutes, take a butter knife around the outside of the edges to make sure that it doesn't stick at all. Now Irish soda bread is known for being a very dense and filling bread. This one definitely is. A little bit of sugar and the whole wheat kind of give a little bit of sweetness to this, but you definitely want to put something on it. I typically will serve it with a vegan butter or some sort of jam or jelly to be able to lighten it up a little. Colcannon is a traditional Irish side dish made out of potatoes and cabbage. Now these are common ingredients found in Ireland, so it was something simple for people to put together. We're going to start with five large potatoes diced. Put those into boiling water until they're tender. Now I'm taking this out of the screen just so we can do each step of this. 
because you'll actually need three pans to complete this dish. We'll add two cups of shredded cabbage to boiling water and cook until tender. In our third pan, we're going to cook one white onion diced in a saute pan. But we're actually going to start to cook it and then add about a cup of almond milk to this, just to tenderize it up and give this a whole depth of flavor. Now I'm continuing to cook this over a high heat just until the milk starts to boil. Once it boils, I'm going to reduce it down to a simmer until my onions are very tender. Now after my potatoes are fork tender, I'm going to get out a strainer and I'm going to strain off the potatoes. I'll add my onions that I've cooked in almond milk. Then I'll add a quarter teaspoon of nutmeg to this mixture and salt and pepper to taste. I started out with about a teaspoon of each and I might add more later. Now we'll mash the entire mixture up. I don't want this to get too smooth. I want it to be like a chunkier texture. Now I'll drain my cabbage off, and then I'm going to add this to the mixture by folding it in. Now you can add some vegan butter to this if you'd like to. It's very traditional to do it that way. I like it just as it is this way, but my family definitely likes the butter added to it. Next we're going to do a shepherd's pie. This recipe is actually taken from the Ruby website as well, so you can follow along there if you'd like to. Now this actually just starts off with a mushroom gravy. So you've seen us do this before. We're going to add about one small white onion diced to our pan and then cook it down with no oil. I'm actually just gonna let this sweat out, and then once the onions start to sweat a little bit, and they start to stick, I'm gonna add in some other ingredients. We'll add three cloves of garlic, minced, and then about a teaspoon of rosemary and a teaspoon and a half of thyme. I'll deglaze the mixture with a little bit of vegetable stock. Now, in our ruby recipe, we use Marsala wine, but I couldn't get it for this one, but it's easy to be able to just replace that with a little bit of vegetable stock. This is great if you don't do wine either. We'll add three cups of wild mushrooms. This is a mix of maitake, shiitake, and just a regular button mushroom. Feel free to use any mushrooms you actually have on hand. I just like to mix it up a little bit so you have a bigger flavor profile of mushrooms. Shiitake is a wonderful one for doing this too. So we're going to cook this down, let it release some of its liquid. Now I'm going to start mixing in some of my dry ingredients, starting out with three tablespoons of dried mushroom powder. Now that's just basically mushrooms that have been dried, blended up into a powder. We'll add about three tablespoons of nutritional yeast, a tablespoon and a half of apple cider vinegar, two and a half tablespoons of tamari. And on top of that, just to wetten it up a little bit, I'm gonna add two cups of vegetable stock and then stir this mixture well so all those dry ingredients dissolve into this mixture. Now after this has started to cook down a little bit, I'm actually going to make a slurry. Now this slurry is just three tablespoons of flour, and I'm going to add about a half a cup of vegetable stock to that as well. So I'm just going to mix it in this small bowl with a fork just to form a slurry. And this will help to thicken up this gravy.
Now for the shepherd's pie, we're actually going to add a cup of shredded greens to this too. The Ruby recipe says about three quarters of a cup, but I always like more greens in it. So you can even put more in if you'd like to. Next I'm going to saute about two to three large portobello mushrooms. The recipe calls for a cup, but I think it could use a little bit more to tell you the truth. We're just going to use the dry saute method on this, like we've all done in the classes. So we'll wait for the natural juices to come out of the mushrooms, and if they ever stick to the bottom of the pan, we can just deglaze with a couple tablespoons of vegetable stock. Once they're done, we can just put them to the side, and we'll be ready to start building up our shepherd's pie. Now I'm going to start by putting these mushrooms in the bottom of our dish. Another variant that I do on this recipe is by adding about a cup and a half of frozen peas and carrots. I just like the texture and the color in this. You can use other vegetables if you want to. This is just my preference. Now I'm going to add the gravy mixture to the top of this. Now I'm going to set this aside while I start working on my garlic butter. Now this is another ruby recipe that's included on the shepherd's pie. We're going to start with two cups of white onion diced, about a quarter cup of garlic, and a sprig of thyme on top. Now make sure it sits evenly on the bottom of a pan, and you want to put veg stock in there just to lightly cover. You barely want this to be floating. We're going to put it in the oven at about 400 degrees for 30 to 45 minutes. You want to check on this regularly though. About every 15 minutes when you check on it, just make sure that the liquid has not disappeared. If you've taken the test on garlic being overcooked, you know how bitter it can be and we don't want the garlic to overpower this dish. Now I've taken about a quarter cup of almond milk and I've taken, instead of cashews, I actually used a cup and a half of pine nuts and soaked them overnight. It's a slightly different texture and flavor, but I have a family member who has an allergy to cashews, so I'm using this instead. Now I'm just going to put this into a small food processor. You can also put this into a Vitamix or a blender, and you'll actually get a great consistency on it. This is just easy for me. We're looking for an airy texture. You don't want a lot of chunks in this at all because we're going to be putting it into our potatoes, which we're cooking next. We'll start with two pounds of russet potatoes diced. And we're going to boil these potatoes until they're fork tender and ready to mash. So now that our potatoes are fork tender, ready, cooked, and ready to go, we're actually going to start adding some of our seasonings to this. We'll add a quarter cup of almond milk, about one cup of our garlic butter, and then we'll mash the entire mixture together. Now we're ready to combine the two. Now usually you would use a pastry bag to be able to pipe on the potatoes on the top, but I'm going to actually use a Ziploc bag today. It's actually really easy, just cut off the corner and leave just enough of the hole that you actually want to squeeze the potatoes through. This is actually a very simple technique if you don't have a pastry bag. Just start to turn it inside out a little bit and then you can actually start to fill the baggie with your potatoes or whatever mixture you have. Once you have it inside, squeeze it into the corner and be able to pipe out the corner here. Now this is not the cleanest look, but it works very well. Now lastly, I'm going to put a little paprika on here just as a garnish. There's no measurement, just a couple pinches on top to be able to make it look nice. And then we're going to bake the entire thing at 375 for 15 to 20 minutes. Since all the separate components of this have already been cooked, we really don't need to heat it that long in the oven. 
This is actually a great meal and it's great for leftovers too. We're just gonna garnish it with some parsley and then serve it out onto a dish. Now we're going to make a vegan Bailey's Irish cream. This is actually a very simple recipe. I'm going to do it in a bowl, but this is just as easily done in a blender. It actually starts off with a third of a cup of espresso or about three ounces. Next, we're going to pour in a quarter cup of sugar. Now it's kind of a lot of sugar, but there's going to be a lot more added to this. About a teaspoon of cocoa, and then I'm going to whisk this together. Now I'm going to add about a teaspoon of almond extract, one tablespoon of vanilla extract, and then I'm going to add an entire cup of whiskey or rye. Now I use Jameson for this just because it's St. Patrick's Day and I'm going for that theme. But if you don't want this to be alcoholic, you can also just exclude the whiskey altogether. Then we're going to put in two cups of full fat coconut milk. Now this is Bailey's, so this is not something you're going to be drinking if you're on a diet. It, the fat is something that you definitely want to be able to contribute in this drink as well. Next, I'm just going to transfer it into a bottle or a jar to be able to serve it out of. Now I have this one little jar here and a funnel, so I'm just going to pour it in from the top. This is something you'll want to probably drink pretty quickly. It will last in the refrigerator for about a week, but because there's so much coconut milk in it, it will solid up. So you need to take it out of the fridge to let it unsolid a little and then give it a good shake. I actually love serving this just over ice. You can use it as a mixer or put it in other recipes if you'd like, but just a cup of this over ice, super great and just reminds me of St. Patrick's Day. Now this next one is just for fun. The Shamrock Shake, the staple of a McDonald's menu at the holiday. This is still a pretty processed version, but it's fun to be able to play with it a little. I have a quarter cup of almond milk, and I'm going to use five fresh mint leaves. Next, I'm gonna use a mint chocolate chip ice cream that I got from the grocery store. Now you could definitely go with an unprocessed version of this that you can make at home. But this is just a simple version of this recipe. I will put a link to another version that's more whole food, if you'd like to, in the comments. Now, even though this is mint chip ice cream, I'm still going to add about a half a teaspoon of mint extract to this to really get that big mint flavor out of this. So we have fresh mint, mint extract, and the ice cream itself. Now, if the ice cream wasn't already green, I'd use some actual green food coloring or spirulina, but this one is. So here we have it all blended up. If it's not warm, it might take a little bit more almond milk to be able to get the consistency you want. Now, this milkshake should not be very thick. You want it to pour out pretty easily so you can actually help drink it through a straw. One of the reasons you actually want to blend it if it has chips in it as well. So this is just an easy throwback to some of our younger days when we used to go to McDonald's for a holiday. Not that we do that anymore, but it sure is fun to be able to share that experience with our kiddos. Well, I hope you enjoyed seeing some of my favorite St. Patrick's Day meals. I certainly had fun making them. I do understand that last one was very processed. So our own Patrick has included a whole food plant based version of this uh, shamrock shake featuring avocados, bananas, spinach uh, that others might choose to make instead. So with that, let's open it up to our forum of questions and get to it so we can answer some questions that have come in while we're watching the video. 
So our first one is from Margarita. Um, I love a good shepherd pie, but now that I'm vegetarian, I'm not sure what to use to get the same flavor profile without meat using impossible meat. Any suggestions? So that's a great question for the one that we just did uh, on this. I used portobello mushrooms. Um, you know, after making that one, I thought it could use a little bit more. So I used uh, two caps of portobello mushrooms. I probably would probably use four to double that up. Um, and that gives that nice umami flavor into it. So um, if you don't want to do that, I've also done this using a lentils, like a green lentils. Um, and you can add some other spices to it to be able to kind of bring out the umami as well. Maybe a little bit of paprika. You could cook them with a bay leaf as well. Um, and then you can also do some other meat substitutes if you want to, um, you know, like a seitan crumble um, if you'd like. You know, the Beyond Meat is um, fine. I'm not a huge fan of it. I don't use it a lot. But, um, you know, so those are some of the other options. Definitely do some mushrooms for that or, um, you know, uh, looking at the lentil option, too. Um, all right. The next one is from Sarah. My Irish grandmother used to make all sorts of baked fruit desserts, but their oat and flour toppings all included lots of butter. Is there a whole food plant-based topping that's equally satisfying? Yeah, that's actually, you know, uh, when I just started doing a little bit of research on Irish cooking for this uh, in particular, and butter is pretty much on everything. You know, I didn't use it on much um, for this at all. In fact, I didn't think I use it for a single recipe for this, but Cole Cannon, the recipe that we did today, typically has tons of butter on it. Um, my mom makes that recipe for St. Patrick's Day every year, um, and she puts a good amount of plant-based butter on it. And that's just kind of traditionally how it's made. Um, you know, it definitely has a lot of fat to it. So um, I understand what you mean. So if you're trying to do those baked desserts with that kind of oat crumble on the top, um, there are a lot of different ways to be able to do that. Um, I'm trying to think of, you know, just an easy oatmeal kind of topping that I've done before. And it's typically something with like, a, you know, oats, uh, cinnamon. And instead of the butter, I'll usually use like a coconut oil or something like that. But if you're not using the oil, that's okay. I just kind of do that to be able to get it a little bit sticky to stick together as well, too. Um, but you can definitely do those crumbles without having the butter um, on the top as well. Uh, so it's, you know, again, just kind of those oats, some cinnamon and maple syrup is the other thing I usually put on that. And then you can do that to be able to bake that up and it'll get a nice crisp on the top of those desserts too. So, um, all right. Next on our queue here is uh, from Terry. Thank you for offering a class that helps new plant-based folks get some ideas going ahead of time. Yeah, of course. You know, when we plan some of our holiday um, themes, I always try to do them at least a week before the holiday. That way you can um, experiment with the dishes if you want to, or if you would like to be able to just get some ideas from it. You know, um, it's you know, a lot of times, um, you know, you need to be able to prep a little bit ahead of time to be able to get these recipes out there. So glad to be able to help do that as well. Um, all right. Our next one's from Kathy. Uh, traditional Irish cooking involves so much dairy. I'd love to hear if you have a low fat oil free vegan renditions of the Irish kitchen. Um, yeah, thanks. So that's very true. Um, you know, when you traditionally look at Irish food, uh, the staples are typically um, lamb, but like, you know, dairy is a big one of those. Um, and they traditionally didn't eat much uh, beef um, in Ireland because they use the milk from the cows so much. So they, uh, you know, um, it's something that is used quite a bit in Irish cooking. Now, when I'm doing it, I'm typically just going to use the plant-based alternative. So almond milk is definitely one of my go-tos as far as an alternative milk goes. I will use a vegan butter. There are a lot of different varieties out there for different uses, um, depending on if you're using it for baking or pastries or if you're just doing traditional cooking. Um, but, you know, a lot of times I'm not going to be using those. Uh, if you saw in you know, the, the recipes that we did today, oil was not used in much. I think it was used in the stew, but you didn't really have to do that stuff if you don't want to. Um, so, you know, just kind of being a little bit creative out of those to be able to, um, you know, look at what you can make. And a lot of those traditional recipes you can look at and just kind of sub out equal parts for like a non-dairy milk um, or an, a non-dairy butter. Um, like if you aren't 
wanting to use like a store-bought vegan butter too, there are a couple different recipes you can um, look up. I know that Mayoko has a really good one that they uh, they sell, you know, as well. But um, they also put up the recipe for a vegan butter on those too. The garlic butter that I put up um, typically is made with cashews. I, again, did that with, um, with pine nuts this time just because we have a cashew allergy in the family. So that was something I wanted to be able to switch up so everybody could eat it. Um, and speaking of, um, Kelly says, can the butter be frozen? I made some, but I found no other use besides mashing it into my potatoes. That is typically what I use it for too. And it can be frozen. Um, usually I would just put it into um, ice cube trays to be able to freeze it. That way you can use what you need when you unfreeze it as well. Um, if you put that in an airtight container, I typically put it inside of a baggie or something like that inside of a airtight container and it should last you at least six months in there um, just making sure you don't get frostbite on it as well so you don't want any freezer freezer burn on there as well be frozen and uh, there are a lot of other uses for it but i use it for potatoes more than anything else as well um, blending it into rice actually is a good one too um, you know some of your mushroom dishes you can blend it into as you're sauteing as well depending on if you want to keep it raw or not um, all right, from Nancy, are there certain oils you suggest for healthy cooking? You know, that's a big debate in the plant-based, especially the whole food plant-based world is oils and are they healthy? Um, you know, I'm definitely in the school that you don't want to use too much oils because they are 120 calories per tablespoon of any kind of oil. It doesn't matter if it's coconut oil, olive oil, um, peanut oil, they're all 120 calories per tablespoon with not many vitamins in them. So you're getting a lot of fat uh, with not a lot of fiber. So um, I typically try to do recipes that don't contain a lot of oil in them. Now, if you're looking on the healthier scale of things, um, there's a huge debate kind of out about those. Um, I'm not gonna tell you which one I you know, think is because I think they're all pretty equal because basically they're stripped away of a lot of their nutrients and um, the fiber before they're made into an oil. I have heard people say that like avocado oils and things like that are a little more, um, you know, healthy, but probably it kind of comes down to, um, you know, the quality of the oil that you're buying to be able to make sure that you're getting, um, you know, the, the healthier one in your view. But again, you know, there's a big debate on that one. Uh, a lot of people say no oil is the best way to go. Um, I tend to say in moderation, um, in severe moderation probably is the best way to go. But it also depends, you know, like the recipes that we're doing today, you know, they're not very healthy recipes. Uh, you know, that Bailey's, um, you know, it's a very fatty recipe. Um, so, uh, you know, as far as health goes, we're kind of breaking the norm a little bit for this. So I think one of the bigger concerns to look at is the high heat versus low heat oil. So like olive oil, typically, if you heat it up to a certain degree, will burn off where something like a safflower oil won't. So I hope that helps you, Nancy. Um, Chris, Thanks, Chef. Have you seen an oil-free soda bread recipe? So, you know, I'm trying to think. Let me just refer back to ours. So, again, you can always look at the recipes that are, um, you know, attached down at the bottom um, of this video. So if you look at the bottom right, you'll see references or event document. Um, I'm trying to think of if I used oil in this uh, coal cannon or in the... Um, the soda bread. And the soda bread is actually one that comes right from the Ruby website. So, um, you know, it is an egg and dairy free, but yeah, I'm not seeing oil in that at all, except for where I grease my pan, right? So um, I was just a spray oil that's basically on the bottom of the pan to make sure that it doesn't stick. Um, and what I do typically will, I'll put, um, you know, spray in there and then uh, wipe down the pan so it's not an excess of oil and all I'm doing is getting a non-stick surface and then your parchment paper. If you just trust in the parchment paper, you can totally do that as well too. Um, another soda bread question. Leslie, can the soda bread, on the soda bread, can you use maple syrup or dates instead of the brown sugar? If so, how much? Um, you know, I have not used dates on this recipe and I'm not sure it would hold together quite the same, but I've seen a lot of soda bread recipes that have like raisins and things in it. So a little experimentation might be in order. So I don't have a direct question to say if I've done them before. Maple syrup sounds like it probably would work though. Um, and as far as how much, I can't give you an exact amount because I've never done it. But um, you know, probably for the brown sugar to maple syrup, you could probably get pretty equal amounts to be able to make that work. Um, but again, 
again, a little bit of experimentation is always good. You can also just eliminate the sugar from that recipe at all. I just like a little bit of it, um, you know, in it, but, you know, with a whole wheat flour too, you get a little bit of sweetness too. Another soda bread question. So Jane, can the soda bread be made gluten-free? Actually, yes, it can. You can just use uh, regular gluten-free all-purpose flour. Um, and you'll typically want to add about a tablespoon of um, xanthan gum to that just to be able to help kind of hold everything together. But we also have a nice flax egg in there, so you might not need it. But I typically, if I'm going to I'm gonna substitute, I'm going to put a xanthan gum just a little bit in um, with uh, equaling out for... Um, uh, for the, uh, well, just to switch that out as well. So Chris, uh, thanks chef. Your soda bread is no oil. Yep. Perfect. <laughs> That's great. Um, you know, some people say like some people might say it would be no oil. Um, some people wouldn't because of the spray. So, um, I, I don't think it has oil, but you know, kind of depends on your view. Uh, so Deborah, I help. I need some ideas for a meat substitute for St. Patrick's Day. My husband does not like tofu, tempeh, or seafood. Also, is there a good way to cook cabbage that's not so odorous? Yes, actually, there is. Um, so let's start with the meat substitute for St. Patrick's Day. You know, I was this close to doing like a corned beef and cabbage recipe for this one. Um, I typically would do that out of a tofu or a tempeh though. So if he's not a big tempeh fan, um, you might, you know, like the seitan that we did for uh, the the lamb stew or the the, the beef and Guinness stew. Um, that might be if uh, a good substitute if your husband is kind of making that transition towards plant-based foods. I use it, but I use it pretty sparingly. You know, I might have seitan once a month or once every two months. You know, it's pretty... Uh, it's not often that I use it just because there's a ton of gluten in it. Um, you know, but the the great thing about things like tofu is you can make it taste all kinds of different ways and you can change the texture on it. So a lot of people, when I hear that they don't like tofu, it's typically because they've had it prepared in a certain way that they might not like in particular. So for, um, you know, if I were going to revisit the vegan corned beef, I would typically use something like... Um, a tofu, you know, but um, you can switch up your meat substitute of, you know, whatever you want. And then for something on uh, corned beef, it's actually kind of cool because you just make it like a brine that you would do out of it. So uh, it's typically kind of salty, but you do that with a pickling spices and then mustard seeds, coriander seeds, um, a bay leaf. And I typically do a little bit of beet just for color. So just a little beet juice in it. Um, and then choose your meat. So, you know, again, it doesn't have to be tofu. You could also do tempeh, jackfruit would be something you could do, soy curls, seitan, all those kinds of things. I've actually made uh, corned beef, you know, out of all those different ingredients. So kind of experimenting with a little bit to be able to see what works and trying to get the flavor profiles, you know, to fit. So after I would actually um, boil that that mixture, I would bake off the tofu afterward or what it, you know, I would bake the tofu to get the texture to be different, uh, much like our baked tofu assignments in our plant-based classes. So um, if you haven't seen those, I would definitely check that out too. Hope that helps. Deborah. Oh, wait, there's also the cabbage, right? So how do you make cabbage not odorous? So that is one of the things that happens with um, that the cabbage and the, you know, the cauliflowers and stuff is you, they release sulfur when they're being cooked and they can tend not to smell that great, you know, um, especially if you, the longer you cook it. So um, it, the sulfur will actually multiply, you know, in the cabbage. So there are a couple things you can do to be able to get rid of that smell. Um, one of them is to put in a, about a tablespoon of white vinegar with like a whole head of cabbage if you wanted to. Um, it'll help kind of absorb some of that smell, but you want to make sure not to add too much of the vinegar because it can flavor the cabbage from it. Um, I've also heard people putting like a, a, you know, like a cup of vinegar next to the stove where they're cooking and it'll help absorb some of those smells too. Um, I haven't used that one, but I have used the lemon juice, which is basically the same thing, just a little bit of lemon juice in the cabbage and helps get rid of the smell. Um, you know, but like I did that um, for a recipe recently, but realized that it came back, you know, so... Um, you know, it really kind of experimenting with that a little bit, but uh, some sort of acid to be able to help kind of tame that is probably where I would do. Otherwise, a good hood vent on your stove might help out a little bit too. 
Um, all right. So Mary Pat, my mother used to make Irish soda bread and eat gluten-free plant-based substitutes. Yeah. So the one that I did today, I think is a pretty darn good one. It is pretty dense, but uh, it is a great one. Uh, we're just using, you know, instead of the buttermilk, we're using the almond milk and then putting the lemon in it. So it will turn it into a buttermilk. Um, I use almond milk on that one in particular, but you could also use a soy milk or, you know, other ones. I just like the almond because it does have a fat content to it as well. And then I'm using a flax egg instead. So the recipe that's on Ruby, I think uses like a wheat germ, but, um, I was not able to get it. So I just used twice the amount of flax, which worked out great. It worked out really well. Um, all right. From Sarah. Also, chef, how do I enrich my soup stocks before I add the vegetables? My stock is good, but thin in flavor. So, you know, making a good vegetable stock starts with good ingredients and good vegetables. Um, now, I make stock a couple different ways. Like my more traditional way that I make it is I keep all the scraps from the outsides of my onions and the insides of my peppers and the ends of or the peels of my carrots and the ends of celery, and I'll put them all into a freezer bag and put them in my freezer. And once that fills up, I will put it all into a stock pot, fill that up with water, bring it up to a boil, and then down to simmer for at least an hour and a half um, to be able to get that full flavor out of it. Now that's just using scraps, but if you want to get a really decadent, really full stock, you're you're actually going to start just with your vegetables, um, you know, not as scraps. So putting carrots, onions, um, celery in there as your mirepoix is a good start as your base. Put um, maybe some other seasonings if you wanted to as well. You could put a bay leaf in there, maybe a little bit of thyme, depending on what you're um, cooking. But, um, you know, doing the same technique, but just using those other vegetables. There's a couple different stock recipes that we do on Ruby that are great that kind of show you uh, a good base for, um, you know, there's a cabbage soup one, but it basically starts out with a very simple, regular kind of a vegetable stock. That would probably be where I'd address you to be able to go first as a really good start for that. So, um, you won't have a thin flavor out of that at all. And it's also great because we don't use any salt. Um, I always say, you know, we use too much salt in America, but if you want to add it, there's a salt shaker on every table in America. So, um, it's always, uh, something you can add to afterward if you'd like to as well. So Karen, what is your source of seitan? So, uh, that is a Ruby recipe that we used for the seitan. Um, I just cut it into chunks, but you can also buy it in packs. Um, I've seen it in all kinds of different varieties of packs. A lot of times they're slices though, but... Um, you know, I've seen chunked seitan as well, um, but uh, that is a recipe that you can get on uh, the Ruby site. In fact, I did another version of it for um, the uh, Juliette's Bourguignon for our Valentine's Day event. So if you want to see that recipe made from scratch, you can uh, definitely check that one out. Or, yep, there you go, Patrick. Thanks for pasting the seitan recipe from Ruby. That's a great one to be able to look at as well, too. Um, yeah, and thank you, Hannah, for helping out with that for Valerie. Um, so a lot of seitan making there. Um, and again, you know, kind of simple-ish recipe to be able to do. Um, and here's another one about seitan. So from Kelly, can the seitan be made or cooked without oil? I have a heart condition and not have oil. Yeah, you can totally do that. You know, for the seitan that we did in the stew, I just braised it a little bit in the bottom of the pan. You don't have to do that. I just kind of like it to get a little brown on the outside before I do it. Um, but uh, the, you know, you can do it without the oil as well too. Um, you know, if you're doing the traditional uh, recipe um, that we have on the Ruby site, you're actually uh, cooking it completely beforehand. I like to cut it in chunks a little bit or pull it off into smaller pieces before I do it. But you can also see that in the Valentine's Day live event, uh, the way that I do it. Um, and it works really well. It's kind of simple, comes together quick. I don't have to worry about it too much. All right. So Michelle, uh, hi, Chef Dan. My three-year-old grandson is a super picky eater. Any suggestions? Uh, peanut butter on a spoon and chocolate chips are his favorite. and Everything else is mad to him and barely eats. Or he'll like something for a day or two. Um, thanks. So I've got two little ones as well. I've got one that's almost three and another one that's, uh, you know, about a year and a half. Um, and, you know, I started really early with feeding them everything I possibly could to be able to increase their palates. Um, 
you know, but uh, that is something you will see with kids that they will change their mind on things. And one day they might like something and the next day they might not. And part of that is just continually trying with um, different things. One of the things that I have to do a lot is, um, you know, that I'll do a lot that uh, if you checked out one of my, um, I think it's called uh, prepping ahead uh, for plant-based, which is another uh, live event we did. Um, that one in particular, um, you know, I show where I stock different containers in my refrigerator for the week so I can pull different things out. So if my kiddo doesn't like something in particular, I can grab a different recipe or some carrot sticks or some different, um, you know, chopped up vegetables to be able to, to make um, her happy. Uh, but part of that is experimentation and not giving up. Um, you know, I've seen my kid not like something one day and then the next day they did like it. So, uh, you know, part of that is just kind of putting the plate in front of them and saying, this is what we're eating. Um, and, you know, kind of being um, there with that, showing that you're eating the same thing as well, that you're not just eating the peanut butter on a spoon, um, that you're actually eating different things. I like to put a little bit of variety on a plate, especially if I know something that they didn't like last time. So I can put that on it and I'll keep it kind of separated out from everything else. So if she likes the other stuff, maybe she'll continue on to the other ones as well. So um, there is no easy answer to that. It's basically, uh, you know, kind of experimenting or experimentation and seeing what works best for your little guy there. Um, and thanks, Patrick, for putting the other live event up there. It's plant-based menu planning. Um, I love that Patrick is the guy who helps us with all our videos here. And this is our St. Patrick's Day event, too. So just to mention in there, it's a nice holiday for Patrick. Uh, Susan, what is the heating element I'm using? Um, I don't know exactly what the brand is or anything, but it is just a little tabletop uh, burner that runs off of a butane fuel. Um, they sell hundreds of kinds of those things. I just use it for cooking demonstrations. And uh, I can't think of what the brand of it is, though. But um, if you just do a quick Google search, um, you'll probably find like eight different kinds of uh, tabletop cooking surface, you know, using butane. Um, so sorry, I can't be too much more help on that. But uh, if you email me, Susan, at dan at ruby, uh, dot com, I can get back to you on that as well, too. All right. So Valerie, for the stew, could you use tofu instead of seitan? Yeah, my family's not a big fan of seitan. So yeah, you definitely could. You don't have to do uh, seitan in that. Um, if you're using tofu for it, though, I would probably bake it beforehand because if you just put it in there, it's probably going to fall apart a little bit. You might want something a little more hearty, like maybe even um, like, uh, tempeh would be a good choice for that as well, too. But if you are using tofu, just make sure to bake it ahead of time so you get a nice kind of dense, more condensed um, thing and add it towards the end, just like we added the seitan, um, to be able to make sure that when you're, you know, turning the, uh, the stew that it's not going to break up that uh, tofu into little tiny pieces. What kind of potato masher did you use to make that cold can? And I've never seen that one before um, from Hannah. So that is, uh, yep, thanks, Patrick. There's my potato masher. It is uh, an OXO brand. I've had it for <laughs> probably 20 years and haven't even thought about it, um, you know, but that's the potato masher. It is one of those, that, uh, you know, in drawers, it's the worst, though. If you're trying to close a drawer and there's always a potato masher in the way. So that little caveat for that potato masher, just to give you the heads up. Um, all right. So Diane, do you remove the gills in the portabella? If so, do you have any tips on doing that without destroying the rest of the shrooms? Yeah, that's actually a really good point. So, um, if I'm going to be taking, I'm going to use my little coaster here as an example. So if I'm taking the portabella, I'm typically going to put it in the palm of my hand like this. I'm going to remove the center stem. And then I'm going to take a spoon and just kind of go along the outside like this very gently as I go and then dump out the gills just like this. So as I go along on this, I'm just going to slowly go along the inside and then keep dumping the gills out of that portabella. Now you want to look around the outside edge of that too because a lot of times the gills will get stuck on the inside. So just make sure to be able to get those. Holding it in your palm helps kind of cup it so you're not going to be breaking it apart too. And you don't have to be too hard on it. So be gentle when you're going in to be able to remove those gills. But that is a great, um, it's a great question. Uh, Margarita, is ghee an acceptable whole food plant-based ingredient? Typically not. Ghee is a butter um, and you know, in the plant-based world, uh, we typically don't use uh, dairy products. 
Um, you know, there are different uh, interpretations of what plant-based can be, um, but typically ghee is not one of those things that we put in there. Um, you know, I'm a huge fan of Indian cooking, so ghee is something I'm used to seeing a lot of, but when I'm cooking with it, um, you know, to be able to open up the spices and stuff, I'm usually having to do it in like a water saute or something like that as well. So yeah, ghee is not something that we use in the whole food plant-based world. Uh, Lillian, what is the difference between vital wheat flour and regular whole wheat flour? Thanks. That's a great question. So vital wheat flour is typically the gluten that has been taken out of the whole wheat flour. So you'll actually work the, um, the flour typically in a water and until you get all the gluten kind of that it comes out in this big ball, which is kind of crazy. I've only done this in experimentation to be able to see what this is, but that's really at the simplest form, it's all the wheat taken out of the flour and that's your vital wheat gluten. Um, and it's just makes it so it re it's really sticky when you cook it and really, really dense. So that's the essential ingredient for any kind of a seitan is that vital wheat gluten. Hope that helps. Um, there's some great videos out there if you want to uh, Google that as well, too. Uh, Dana, TVP is a great meat substitute, so it's easy to flavor your taste. Yeah, in fact, um, when I was first going to do that recipe, for the, the stew, I was almost gonna use the uh, textured vegetable protein, but decided against it just because it'd be a little tiny chunks of little things in it too. I use textured vegetable protein sometimes. A lot of times I'll use it to use make like a taco meat. Um, you know, I live in Texas, so uh, a lot of people um, are expecting some sort of meat in it. So I'll use uh, a textured vegetable protein um, instead. And that's great because, you know, it's basically like a one cup of TVP to two cups of hot water. Um, or you can just, I usually just put it in the pan and put the hot water in and heat it all together. And then I'll put in, you know, just some other spices, like a little bit of garlic powder and a little bit of onion powder. Uh, I put in a little bit of fennel too, just kind of get that sausagey kind of flavor into it as well too. But yeah, so TVP is something uh, as a meat substitute that a lot of people do use. And I use it every so often as well too. Um, Sierra, hi Chef Dan, I'm looking forward to this event. I took a peek at your whole Kids Foundation Kids Club and as a new mother, I must say it was a happy discovery. Thanks for looking up for our little ones. I'll be using the resource often. Well, thank you so much, Sierra. A whole Kids Foundation um, is near and dear to my heart. I love the work I did with them um, in school food in particular, uh, working with teachers to be able to be better mentors to kids. Um, it is an unbelievable resource for parents too. So the whole Kids Club, you can download all kinds of materials just around fruits and veggies. Um, and we cater it specifically for um, you know uh, adults that are wanting to be better mentors to kids through food. So glad you're loving it. Uh, Linda, um, are those fresher for the stew? Actually, yeah, they were. Um, I used, let's see, thyme and rosemary and parsley, but you know, uh, my parsley was not fresh for the stew, but all the other ones were. So the thyme and the rosemary were fresh, but the parsley was not. And that was just specifically because when I got my delivery of parsley, it was not flat leaf parsley, it was curly parsley, and I'm not a big fan of the texture of that in stews. Um, so uh, I used the dried parsley instead. Dried herbs would be fine for it. I just like the, the, um, you know, the natural oils that come off of the fresh herbs, so I use them as often as I can. Uh, Linda, I've got a couple ones for me here. So uh, do some non-dairy milks curdle better than others? Um, mine never looks lumpy. That's actually probably because of the fat content. So I usually use almond milk if I'm going to try to make a buttermilk um, because the fat content helps with that. If I'm using a soy milk, it's not going to look as lumpy as that. Um, and I said we, I think we said to let it sit for 10 minutes. And quite honestly, it was something I stepped away for probably 15, um, maybe 20. Oh, so it probably looked a little bit more lumpy just because I went off and did something else and came back to it. Uh, but yeah, so non-dairy milks that have more fat in them will definitely curl better um, than ones that have less fat in them. And also from Linda, is there a certain type of potato to use in coal cannon? That's a great question. So uh, russet gold is typically the one that I tried to find. I couldn't on this one, so I used russet potatoes. But uh, I do like those, um, the the gold ones, just they're, it's a really good potato for doing, um, for those for coal cannon as well. So if you can find them, that's great. But if not, a regular russet will do just fine. Uh, Karen, is there a whole grain substitute for all-purpose flour in the Irish soda bread? 
you know, I've not made that, but um, you can definitely experiment with that. I know that the Ruby recipe has that um, little bit of regular flour in that, um, you know, and it's just, it's uh, like a half a cup for the two and a half a cups of whole wheat. Um, and I haven't made it without that. So um, I can't tell you on that one, but you can definitely experiment with it and tell us how it turns out. So hope that works, Karen. Um, Hannah, hello chef, what is stout that you used in the Irish stew? Could I just use some more vegetable broth instead of stout? Yes, you could definitely use, uh, you know, a vegetable broth instead of the stout. Um, I used a Guinness just because Guinness now has a vegan version, which is nice. So um, the other thing that they also do for this is I did not know that they made a non-alcoholic Guinness. So you can use a non-alcoholic version of the Guinness if you're trying to avoid the alcohol. But if you just don't want the flavor of the stout, you can definitely do a vegetable broth instead. Just use equal amounts that you're doing, um, which I think was eight ounces of the the uh, stout. So just do an eight ounces of uh, vegetable broth, which is came out to almost two cups, a little shy of two cups. All right, so Nadine, um, what are you cooking the onion for in the shepherd's pie without oil? Oh, why are you cooking the onion for the shepherd's pie without oil? So I'm just doing that to avoid the calories. Uh, that entire recipe, I don't believe I used any oil at all for the shepherd's pie. So um, it's literally just to avoid the calories. You know, there's a lot of things going on in that, lots of potatoes, lots of different things. Just the oil, um, you know, typically if I don't need it, I'm not going to add it to it. So I did it without the oil instead and just deglazed with uh, a vegetable stock. So that's a very common technique in a lot of our classes. If you haven't gotten there in your classes, you'll you'll see it coming up as well, is the, uh, you know, cooking without oil. And uh, we usually do it as an example for Ruby using mushrooms, but it works just great on caramelizing onions as well, too. So, um, yep, so that's just to avoid the calories. Uh, Liza, so tamari seems to find its way into a lot of recipes. Why is that? Um, it adds a nice uh, umami flavor to it, and it also gives a little bit of sodium to it without using that salt shaker a lot. Um, you know, tamari is a very unique kind of play flavor profile. If you, um, and I, I suggest people to do this. You can take like shoyu, tamari, soy sauce. You know, if you put them all next to each other and just take like a sip of each one or just you know, just a little dot of it on the end of a spoon, you can see there's a huge difference between all of those too. So, um, but particularly for some of these, it just adds a nice depth of flavor to it. And um, I think it was on the soup that we used it on this one, just kind of helped increase those flavors that were in there because that soup, it's a pretty amazing soup. If you haven't tried it, um, you know, one of my wife's, uh, my my mom, my, my wife's mother, her favorite is a beef and Guinness stew. And that is actually a perfect filling for that one as well, too. Um, all right. So from Tracy, hello, Chef Dan. Thanks for the presentation. I'll be trying some of the dishes for St. Patrick's Day. Great, Tracy. So I'm glad you enjoyed it and uh, would love to be able to maybe send us some pictures of what you did for it. It'd be fun to be able to see that. So um, have a happy holiday for that as well, too. Um, Jim, so corned beef and cabbage. I'm guessing you're looking for something on that recipe. So I just kind of talked that one through and it's typically just having your, um, you know, if you look up a, a corned beef recipe, you can pretty much use the same mixture that you're using for um, the beef, but just do it for the, the like the tofu or the seitan or something else as well too. I do like the beet juice just because it makes it the pink color as well too. Um, Carolyn, the seitan recipe seems to only the mix. How do you prepare it? So um, on the Ruby site, it should be it should show you the the steps through on it, but it's you're basically taking your dry ingredients, um, which is on the Ruby recipe. I believe it is um, the vital wheat gluten and let's see, it's a mushroom powder in that one and I think some paprika. Maybe a couple other things that I might be missing. And then, oh, mixing that with your wet recipe, which is a vegetable stock, a vegan Worcestershire. Uh, what else is in that? I think ketchup was in it. Uh, a couple other things. And then you reserve some of your liquid um, after, you know, kind of making your dough ball and then you're braising it. So you put the liquid over the top and the entire mixture uh, cooks in the liquid that you're doing as well. Now, um, for this version that I did for it, uh, I will typically 
um, before I braise it, I'll actually pull it apart into pieces and be able to let it cook that way. Now, if you do it that way, you don't have to cook it in the braising liquid. You can actually just cook it right in the stew um, and it works just fine that way as well. All right, so Christy, can you post a vegan butter recipe? I can't find it on the Ruse Research and there Patrick has got it for you right away, which is great. So um, thanks, Patrick. There is the the, the butter recipe. Um, it is definitely kind of a popular one out of those recipes as well, too. Well, those are all of our questions. We got through them pretty quickly. I just want to say thank you guys so much for joining us for our Feast of St. Patrick and our Ruby event. My name is Dan Merrick and bon appetit.